come to our question and uh, answer session. Uh, the rules are quite simple. Um, you can address the question to the entire panel. You can address individual uh, panelists, and the panelists also are entitled to make comments uh, on each other. Um, I'll s I would like to start with a question for uh, Sean Gap regarding translations. Um, I'm, of course, s somewhat familiar with the difficulties of translations myself. Um, my question is, does it make a difference as far as the quality of translations is concerned if the person who does a translation um, is an accomplished writer in his own language uh, as compared to people who are just translators uh, and don't do anything but translating? It, it, certainly, it certainly gives you a more glossy final product if the translator is also a very good writer. However, um, I've done quite a lot of translation into English from va various foreign languages, and although I thought I knew those languages very well, uh, tra professional translators often said, no, you, you have failed to understand the subtle meaning of, of this particular phrase. A and so the, the quality of the translator's writing is of very great importance. But, but also the translator's feel for the very small subtleties of the original text I is also very important. And that is not something that you acquire just by knowing the language and thinking that you can translate um, a text from one language to the other. It does require a great deal of practice. <coughs> what about bilingual? depends on the bilingual person. Um, of course, if you, Hans, do you translate your own things between English and German? Do, do you translate your own work between English and German? Sometimes. Which means that you've produced two different works, which one day will confuse your biographers no end, because I'm sure there are small differences of emphasis between the two versions. One day, people might kill each other over those differences. <laughs> um, also, a question for Sean. Um, sorry about that. Should have come in later, but still. Um, looking at politicians in the UK, Sean, over the last hundred years, I would guess that 100 years ago, indeed much less than 100 years ago, a lot of people in government would have read the classics. And that today, uh, maybe nobody in government has had that background. Do you think that change has affected perspective of government over those decades? Every so often, I denounce the politicians currently in charge as stupid. And it, it strikes me as undeniable at the moment that the conservative politicians who have put themselves in charge of our leaving the European Union do not understand the complexities of the task they've set themselves and refuse to listen to anybody else who may understand those complexities. And so it is very easy to say, in the olden days, when politicians had read Plato and Tacitus, you got a better quality of government. It's just that you have mentioned a hundred years ago. And a um, hundred years ago, the British government was taking bribes from various um, commercial interest groups, primarily the armaments makers, to keep the Great War running and running and running even though the war could and should have finished in December 1916. And much as I despise Theresa May and her friends, they have not done anything as shockingly immoral as that. So um, 
the politicians a hundred years ago, yes, they were accomplished men. Uh, th they had many more interests, many more respectable interests than the current crop of politicians in charge. But I don't think it made them any better. This question is for Peter. You mentioned that corruption is a problem in China. And just to be the devil's advocate, I, I, was, I was thinking about what Mises said, that capitalism breathes through loopholes. And um, I thought to myself, well, you mentioned that the CCP is almost like a monarchy. And just if we think of King CCP, let's say being one man, um, sort of like I'm one man deciding what to buy when I go shopping. It's not a problem that people try to corrupt me when I try to spend money shopping by offering something very enticing at a low price. And similarly, in China, if a businessman is presented uh, with the fact that he's broken a law and he faces execution or something, for him to say, well, I can perhaps help your son set up a new business and uh, you know, every, this can all go away. It may not be that bad a problem because the wealthy people in China, like anywhere in the world, are successful entrepreneurs who have uh, commanded resources efficiently to satisfy consumer demands. So these are people who should command the ability to avoid being prosecuted by these laws. So, I mean, it's an outrageous thing to say, I think, but, but do you really believe that, that if corruption were eliminated in China, that this would be an improvement? Well, most people think it's a problem, <clears throat> but uh, I think, uh, well, in some times, it's also a solution. Uh, but, but I really have to say uh, the, corrupt, the corruption now in China uh, has de de deteriorated in terms of quality compared to the corruption 30 years ago. Because um, in those times, basically the bribe you need to pay the government, it's, it's like a market price. But now, because China is so big, and the interest, so you, you need to rely on the government, the interest involved is so huge. And, and also the government keeps saying, I mean the ruling, the leadership keeps saying they need to crack down on corruption. So, so the, the government official would not receive bribe as easily as before. You, you need to be connected to bribe the people. So, so in the past, everyone can bribe, and, and it becomes a market price. But now, it's getting more convoluted. And, and, and if you are not connected enough, you don't know how to bribe, then, then it becomes a problem because it, it is no longer a market price. Um, so it's, it's changing, uh, but I, I, I don't think I'm the first one uh, to say corruption it's all, maybe also a solution for China. Uh, uh, another uh, Chicago economist, uh, his name is Stephen Jern, used to be saying, yes, corruption well, functions like a market price. Uh, in fact, uh, the current president, when he emphasized cracking down on corruption, which many of us think is just one faction using corruption as an excuse to cleanse the, the other faction. But anyway, I, 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 two years ago, when China economy slowed down and also the stock market crashed, partly because, because the corruption, uh, anti-corruption campaign, it was so bad that most uh, government officials start to, not, they stop to receive bribe bribery and everything just stop hold into ground because they, they just don't, don't don't want to do anything when they can receive bribe they they are very energetic and they they like to see you know like bridges building you know yeah so yeah in a sense I think um, yeah <clears throat> well, well but I think the nature is changing it, it was healthier in the past but now it's getting, getting worse. I have a, a remark to Mr. Bandulet, if, if possible. Um, there are two visions of uh, Germany. Uh, one is that it's a powerful Germany. Uh, it's exploiting all the, all the European Union to his own goals. 
and uh, the vision you, you presented is uh, Germany is being looted, robbed by, by them. Well, those two visions are not contradictory. Uh, we have an example with Russia, who has been exploited by the Soviet Union. Exploited by the Soviet Union. The, uh, Russia as a republic was the, the, the poorest republic. They are, they are paying to the other republic to be in the uh, Soviet Union, just to have uh, all the republic to fight with uh, American imperialism. And I think there are some people in the uh, German political class, you, you can uh, say this, is it true, who want to have European Union around the Germany and pay them to have a powerful European Union to fight with American imperialism for a revenge for the Second World War. Uh, well, of course, uh, it's more complicated than I could uh, uh, tell the story today in half an hour. Uh, for instance, European in integration also serves uh, the purpose uh, for the German elite to, to be able to hide behind the European construction. Yeah? Uh, or to quote uh, Margaret Thatcher, she once said, as the Germans, uh, are not able to govern themselves, they deny the right to the others. Yeah? This would be a nice circumscription for, um, for the German attitude. Um, and I'm speaking of the political class, of course, not of ordinary citizens. Um, or, or just take Eastern Europe. Um, Eastern Europe receives a lot of money out of Brussels. If you break it down to German net payments, so far uh, considerably above 20 billion euros came from Germany into uh, Poland. Now one purpose behind the whole thing is of course well, to buy the Europeans um, so that they keep quiet, you know? They behave within this European construct. And the problem now is uh, they don't uh, abide by, by that deal any longer, yeah? Uh, countries like Hungary, Poland insist on, on their sovereignty, yeah? And um, <laughs> they, they give nothing in return for the money they get from Brussels. Um, so um, well, I, I think they, they are right uh, because uh, they have suffered enough from, uh, from another kind of hegemony, the Russian ones, and um, they don't want to throw it away their independence. Um, in any case, we must clearly see that the European Union is in a big, big crisis now. Uh, the biggest crisis ever since the integration started in the, f in the 50s. And uh, it might uh, break up somehow. Um, and the biggest mistake, of course, was the euro, because the euro is not sustainable in its present form. And this is what Macron knows, yeah? uh, and um, th that's why he uh, wants a common budget and, uh, um, and common European debt and so on. If he doesn't get it, what he wants? which is, which really is possible, because the German government ca can only go thus far, yeah? uh, then the euro would break up uh, quicker. And, and don't forget, for the first time, uh, the German parliament will have an opposition party um, starting after the September elections. 
äh, wie die Al Alternative for Germany, Alternative für Deutschland. And they are the only party which are um, Euroskeptical, uh, EU skeptical, which don't believe in uh, man made climate change, and so on and so on. It's really for the first time an opposition party, which um, of course might be an obstacle yeah, uh, to, for the government to just go on and on and on with more and more integration like uh, Juncker wants. Yeah. So um, the whole thing is more or less open again yeah, in, 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 in Europe. And if you, if you would ask me what uh, Europe looks like in five or ten years, I, I couldn't give you an answer. Uh, I have a question for Peter Wong. Um, there's another issue about China w that I find very interesting. Uh, first, China holds significant amounts of gold and uh, they recently launched uh, um, an exchange of gold with, with oil. And second, they hold very significant amounts of the US public debt, of the treasury bonds. How do you think that these two uh, issues will affect the further policy of China and how it, it will affect the, the further development of China on the global scene? Um, <clears throat> uh, that may seem strange uh, while like, you keep buying uh, physical gold and on the other hand uh, buying like toilet paper from uh, the US. But um, uh, don't forget, uh, uh, China also produces its own toilet paper. And, and the confidence uh, of the Chinese people believing in the currency comes from also mostly to from US dollar. Because uh, uh, China is still yet uh, an open economy. Uh, it still has uh, uh, um, capital control. Um, so um, uh, the, the Chinese people, when they need to trade uh, with foreign countries, or if they need to travel um, to, to foreign countries, they cannot sell the, the RMB or the Chinese Yuan uh, in the market. Uh, so the final counterparty must be the central bank. So the central bank must keep some uh, US dollar. Like IMF calculated, believe it or not, but, but they kind of have a number. Like uh, for the economy like the size of China, they need at least 2.8 trillion US dollar in order to satisfy the, the trading activity or kind of economic activity. So like if you if you need to keep your US dollar, just putting in um, your own vault, why not you invest some money into the, to the national debt to buy the treasury? So, so <clears throat> yeah, I think somehow China has no choice uh, to keep buying the US dollar or the, the US uh, treasury. Uh, but on the other hand, they are working ways to try to ditch it. Um, uh, but, but I think it, 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 uh, last year they, or, the, or two years ago, they tried. Um, they, they always talk about uh, internationalize uh, the Chinese yuan, which means uh, fully float, fully convertible, eventually a fully convertible uh, uh, Chinese yuan. But, but um, it was backfire last year uh, because of the credit bubble or the asset bubble that I just mentioned, the Chinese, they are now, like at least on paper, so rich. So they, if they all go to this People's Bank of China and redeem the USD, basically um, the central bank will run out, uh, RMB, uh, run out of uh, US dollar to pay them. So I, I think China is kind of stuck 
but by the way, um, I, I, there is also a good uh, development uh, upon uh, China. When the, for the past two years, we see, we superficially, we see um, the state, the state-owned enterprises are gaining momentum and squeezing the private sector. Uh, but on the other hand, because of the uh, housing bubble in China, in terms of wealth, the private sector in China owns more property, or you know, in dollar value. Uh, I mean, I mean, in in, in uh, Chinese yuan value, the proportion of uh, the wealth <coughs> held by the private sector becomes bigger and bigger because of the of the housing bubble because most real estate uh, are owned by private sector. So, so it's kind of strange, like, like the, the, the productive capacity, that kind of thing, uh, more going into the hands of the state, but in terms of wealth, in terms of you know, property, uh, people own more money uh, than the government. So just a development, I want to update uh, everyone, everyone here. I just want to uh, add that um, I, I'm completely convinced that the Shanghai Gold Exchange will uh, grow in importance. Um, and one day will be as important as New York. I mean, the strange thing is, uh, China is the biggest buyer of physical gold uh, in, in the world. They take up uh, all their production and they import gold. And the Americans trade mainly paper gold. But still, the price is more or less set in New York, yeah, which you can watch on a daily basis. And Shanghai, which trades much, much more physical gold, uh, doesn't seem to make the prices. Uh, what, what is always interesting uh, to watch is um, um, the premium or discount of Shanghai gold prices. When there, when there is uh, um, uh, a premium, by which I mean when, when gold is more expensive in Shanghai than in New York, that's a good sign for the gold market. Then you can buy gold or, or, or also in Europe. But um, I don't know what, what you think, but um, um, China is the gold market of the future. Yes, I, I'm convinced of that. And this is an alternative or um, uh, an insurance yeah, against their exposition in dollars. Because the dollars can be blocked or expropriated in case of a conflict. And the normal thing is, uh, in history, has always been the conflict with, uh, between the leading power and uh, the second, the coming power. Like the First World War, England, Germany. Um, this resulted, this was one reason for the fir uh, First World War. And uh, now the difference between previous examples, yeah? Portugal, Spain, Spain against England, then France yeah? versus uh, England, the difference is if I may, may say, <laughs> so, uh, uh, the Chinese diplomacy uh, is very clever, very clever, very cautious, yeah, and um, patient. Yeah. Just compare it to this extremely stupid man Hitler. Yeah, he had in '38 he had all his ca the cards in his hand. Yeah, and he threw them away. He was extremely stupid. Uh, so uh, I have a high regard for China because they seem to do it uh, uh, and they are perfectly right in amassing gold and uh, uh, the government encourages Chinese to buy gold. This is also uh, a difference uh, to, to the West. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, just a quick add-on question for uh, Peter. Uh, what's your general assessment of the economic rationality or irrationality of the CCP? I mean, it's often claimed, and, and uh, it was mentioned right now, that uh, they tend to have a more long-term rationality and that even projects like New Silk Road, which uh, may be considered cross misallocations of capital in, in, in the short view, might turn out in the long term to be economically beneficial. Uh, what's your take on that? Uh, is, is it true that there's a long-term rationality or is it really political total totalitarian well, irrationality? I, I think uh, Dr. Hopper explained it very well. Like if the CCP thing or the, or the founding families, they think they own China, then they would have a more long-term view. Uh, yeah, um, uh, uh, and just to in response um, to um, your question, I think if you want to invest, or well, anyone here want to invest in China, the problem is, yeah, uh, the U.S. could shut down uh, whatever, like confiscate your property, whatever. But China also can shut its gate because it's, it still has capital control. So the problem with China competing with the US is uh, it ha has not yet uh, a, a fully convertible currency. But on the other hand, um, I think uh, the comparison, like Steve Bannon's comparison uh, with China and uh, Germany in the 1930s are wrong in the aspect. Um, I don't know what's the intention of uh, 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 Hitler uh, to start a war when, uh, as you said, in 1938, he basically, you know, made a great profit already. Um, uh, uh, you know, Chinese people, if you ask them uh, really in their heart, I'm not saying, well, I, I, I mean people on the street, um, they do have an aspiration, like China to become number one, like, like not necessarily GDP per capita, but I mean GDP as a nation uh, to surpass uh, US. But because of the sheer size of our population, uh, we don't need to go to war. We just need to improve the productivity of Chinese people, and that's it. We don't need to be aggressive. Uh, and and you know I do have times uh, feel skeptical on China, but but recently I kind of changed my view because of all the technolo technological advancement going on. Uh, think about um, um, the Chinese living in the rural area, but basically Chinese living on the coastal area they are as productive as most Western economies. But, but the major problems come from the rural area. But now you have smartphones, uh, not to mention that like you have physical bridges uh, connecting the interior area, but also informational highways. You know, this is like the capital goods uh, for, for the Chinese, for the rural Chinese. So, yeah, so I, I, I think um, that the Chinese don't need to follow the German way to, to become number one. Uh, Japan, they, they didn't have the same kind of like uh, uh, precursor to become number one because simply because there are too small number of Japanese people where Chinese, uh, you just need to increase their productivity. That's it. Yeah. Um, China has been a pioneer uh, in the development of uh, special economic zones, starting with uh, the, the massive economic success of Shenzhen. And uh, today, as I understand it, uh, almost 40% of the Chinese population lives in, in, in an SCZ. Uh, in, in many ways, the uh, uh, Belt and Road Initiative is a, a continuation of this strategy. Um, do, you, what, do you see China slowing down in this? Or what is the end game? Uh, do they see uh, most of the population living in, the, in a special economic zone in the future? What are the pros and cons of uh, this kind of centrally planned uh, political decentralization and what can the rest of the world learn of, uh, from this? Um, uh, I don't know whether the special, well of course the special economic zone offers uh, more freedom uh, compared to other areas. 
but I think the one more major question, like on the Chinese economy, whether it can keep going. No, no, I have to say, somehow I agree with Donald Trump uh, and, or Steve Bannon. In a way, Chinese benefit a lot from stealing uh, ideas, uh, intellectual property uh, from the US, regardless whether this happens in special economic zone or not. Uh, basically, we do not have R&D expenses. We just took it from, from the from the Americans. Um, but, I mean, uh, so that's what I feel, like I, I, I feel pessimistic if the West would go down and China replace the West simply because the West commits suicide, because this is not a good sign. I, I still think that the Chinese, they are not as innovative when you compare, you know, you know the top elites uh, in the Silicon Valley. Uh, it, it's because, like we, as I said, we do not have freedom of speech. And if you do not have freedom of speech, that limits what you really want to do. You, you can't be really uh, 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 innovative. So, so I think the best scenario would be, obviously, China, we have our own system, and the West, you have your system, and then we compete with, with each other, then that would be good for the human civilization. So, so yeah, I think China, if the West uh, stop here, and then there is as much as the China can steal, and after we have steal everything, every, Every intellectual, uh, even we, some some of us don't believe in intellectual property, but but I mean, there's so much you can steal, and then I think that would be bad for human civilization. So, yeah, that that's would be my comment. Uh, question for Kier. Thank you very much for your speech. It was great. Um, and I immediately, as I was thinking. As you were talking, uh, 2007, Peter Thiel called the top for globalization. He said we're going to kind of fragment a little bit. And Parikana in 2009, he followed up with an article calling for the new middle ages. He said that what, what was going to happen was not only we're going to fragment, we're going to kind of have he said 10 or 12 kingdoms or something like that, where you would kind of everyone would kind of return to a neutral corner and then redevelop their own systems um, and then perhaps come together again sometime in the future. Um, do you see any parallels between what you were talking about, that ordered anarchy in the Middle Ages, and any potential future governing structures later on? And gentlemen, if you want to help him out as well, feel free, but I'd like to hear what Kira has to say. Um, yes, broadly speaking, I would say that there are three phases of history, I mean, in Europe at least, um, when it comes to government. There's the pre-bureaucratic age, when there was no ability uh, to fund and organize a bureaucracy, then there was this very long bureaucratic age. And um, I think we've come to the end of it. It's breaking down before our eyes. What replaces it, I don't know. Um, my preference would be, and I think everyone's preference here would be, um, a Europe of Liechtenstein's. Um, whether that's practical, I don't know, because, as I said, um, the system in the Middle Ages was, even though it varied from place to place, it was heavily based on very strong communities. We don't have that nowadays. Um, well, s uh, some places do, but um, and some good has resulted from the, the, the breakdown of overly strong communities. Um, but a lo an awful lot of bad has also resulted. Um, so it would be very difficult to simply ape the Middle Ages because the, system, the, the systems in the Middle Ages were bottom-up and not top-down. They all emanated from um, the way people behaved and the way people thought. Um, and I don't see any real potential 
for the recreation of anything um, of anything like um, for instance the um, one of my favorite aspects of um, of, of medieval law um, which was um, common in the in the early anglo-saxon system is uh, that of compurgation that could only work oh, co compurgation uh, I should explain what it is um, is you commit a crime um, I uh, I, I, t I swear an oath, a set oath, um, that you have committed a crime against me, um, and then you have to, uh, if you want to deny it, you have to deny it in set terms. Then the local elders, the local, um, the local great men, would decide how many oaths, ha how many more oaths of other people in the local community you would need to um, to help you out. Oath helpers becomes compurgators, hel hence compurgation. Now, that's a very good system in a very local kin-based community. Um, and it seems to me that most things um, in the Middle Ages um, could only operate in that way. Um, one thing that I didn't talk about, and I regret not doing, but then I don't know very much about it, um, I don't know very much about um, urban leagues and city-states, um, and that might be what I'm neglecting. Um, I, I think, yes, um, the Hanseatic League is a very good example. Um, the Hanseatic League acted very much like a state. It um, was able to protect its members. Um, it was able to um, make sure that people could make sure that convoys could trade around the, the, um, around the Baltic and the North Sea, um, but it, it wasn't a state. And it, uh, it had very loose, fluid structures. Um, it had a sort of parliament which met very rarely. Uh, and it, at its peak, I think 38 towns were represented. Um, so yeah, I, I would say rather than looking at chieftains and kingship and so on and so forth, which probably can't be resurrected um, um, or can only be resurrected on a very small local scale, I would say look at um, look at systems like urban leagues, um, city states, um, and things like that. Uh, Peter mentioned that uh, Brexit, uh, especially, was. Uh, quite inspiring last year for us who wants a retreat from an overarching global government uh, or sort of global governing entity. Um, this question is for all four of you. What advice would you give to the British government? I mean, for Sean especially, beyond stop being stupid. Uh, <laughs> I mean, what would be the advice of what to do? Uh, you know, do you continue negotiations? What would be in the negotiations? How do you ex extract the concessions from the European Union? You four are from very different backgrounds, uh, so I'll be interested to know how would you advise if they were to listen? Uh, shall I start? Well, I, I would drive a very hard bargain, and um, uh, in the end, if necessary, uh, just recur to the uh, World Trade Organization and uh, even uh, confront them with an ultimatum. Because my feeling is that the European Commission and the European Union are weaker than they seem to be. Uh, London should, uh, should understand this. Um, I mean, it, it, it was really an affront to uh, put uh, Monsieur Barnier in charge of these negotiations. By that, they really ensured uh, a bad outcome. Uh, another question is, which, which I can't answer, um, is the uh, ruling class in Britain yeah, uh, still like it used to be, let's say, under Thatcher? Or are they weak people uh, who give in in the end? It really boils down. But um, if you confront them, yeah, 
and act strongly. Uh, you can get away with, with a much better deal than it looks now during these negotiations. And they wouldn't have to pay 50 billion uh, euros. I mean, uh, <laughs> but. I'm actually quite happy with the people in, in charge of um, putting, uh, putting Brexit through. I quite like David Davis. I quite like Steve Baker. Um, they both, um, I believe they've both actually addressed former Libertarian Alliance conferences. Um, they're both pretty hardcore libertarians so far as any politician in Britain goes. Um, and the public line at the moment, I think, is as solid as it can be, which is we're perfectly prepared to rely on World Trade Organization rules and we're perfectly prepared to go to come away with no deal. Um, even if that's not possible, I don't see how, if you want to negotiate properly, um, I, I don't see how that shouldn't be the default line to maintain in public. To maintain anything less in public um, would, w would automatically weaken your position. But I know Sean disagrees. Um, I don't necessarily disagree. My, my concern is that um, the, the conservative politicians, who, as I said earlier, have taken control of our departure from the European Union, give every indication of being um, stupid. I may, of course, be mistaken. It may be that the British ministers have a very clever plan and that uh, w we shall walk away from the European Union with a very good deal, uh, which gives us everything that we could reasonably want. It's just that I have spent the past 40 years looking at these people, and I have never been impressed by them, and I have never seen them do anything remarkable. Uh, the Conservatives know that there is one thing they know for sure, and that is that if they do not give us a decent leaving from the European Union, then we shall just ask what is the function of the Conservative Party? This is their last chance. They've lied to us too often, they've betrayed us too often, they, they have now found themselves in the position of having to negotiate an exit from the European Union. They know that it has to be a, a departure which is acceptable to us, the people, and um, which, which generally works. My concern is that although they are aware of the demands placed upon them, that they have no idea how to satisfy those demands. The, the moral quality of our politicians has never been particularly high, but then politics doesn't tend to attract people of great moral integrity. The intellectual quality of our latest crop of politicians really must be seen to be believed. So I don't share, I don't share Keir's optimism uh, about our current situation. I don't think I'm in a position to, to give an answer. Rather, I, I have a question, uh, which is I heard uh, the revival of the Anglo-Saxon former colonies, uh, like basically forming a kind of like a new EU among uh, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom in response to Brexit. I, I don't know how, it sounds a marvelous idea to me, but I don't know how serious uh, it has been discussed uh, in, in Britain. Um, just to add one thing. Uh, we keep reading in the newspapers uh, that these negotiations will go on for three, two or three years and are terribly complicated. Now what they tell us is something about the nature of, the, of this Brussels monster. Uh, the, if you look at the, the legal paperwork uh, which exists in Brussels, this is nearly 100,000 pages. Now th this explains why 
negotiating this, or, or negotiating, well, uh, leaving uh, this system is terribly complicated. How, how long does it take to go through uh, 100,000 pages? It's, it's just crazy. It shows how crazy the whole uh, construct is. So, uh, in the end, it is really is possible uh, that the British have no choice but to tear it up and just throw it away and walk away. Peter's question, how serious is this possibility <coughs> of an Anglo-Saxon alliance? I don't think it's very likely at all. Uh, one of the reasons we joined the European Union or the European Economic Community in 1973 was that um, our existing trade with the Commonwealth w was not thought sufficient. It, it, was not thought, it was not thought a good and viable alternative to our likely trade from the European countries. And apart from the fact that we all have cousins in Australia and New Zealand and Canada, why should we why should the Australians want to trade with us? They have a very lucrative trade with China and the other Eastern markets. There is not much that we have to offer them. And although their butter and lamb can be very nice, we get that, um, we get that from much closer to home, from our European neighbours. Um, we shall need some kind of deal with the Europeans. Let, let me put this very quickly. The zero option, the idea of leaving the European Union and relying purely on world trade organization rules, would be an excellent idea if we had a low tax, lightly regulated economy with um, politicians in charge who are prepared to make very rapid and intelligent adjustments to, to the remaining burden of regulation. But Britain is not a low-tax, lightly regulated country. The people in charge are not intelligent. The minister, as I say, Theresa May lost her majority last June, which means that her ability to do anything radical is effectively zero. And so if we crash out of the European Union without a deal, in our highly regulated, corporatized economy, there may well be, indeed there will be, serious problems. It's, it's very well to say, well, if the British government were to have a bonfire of controls, if it were to repeal all of these regulations, yes, of course, that would be an ideal scenario. It's just that looking at the correlation of forces in London, that is not going to happen. And so um, I, 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 I do think the politicians should at least be honest with us that they don't know what they're doing and they don't know what they will do next. They don't even know what they ought to do. Sorry, that's very depressing, but then what do you expect? It's me. <laughs> um, I have a last question to um, Sean. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you for the tribute to the um, uh, Greek and Roman classics. And second, I want to ask you whether you agree with the view that um, Europe developed very well as long as it's based on three pillars. First of all, the um, Greek, um, the ar view of Aristoteles in an objective the view and belief in an objective truth of how Aristotle has described it. The um, Greek, uh, uh, the uh, um, Roman view of law, especially volentin on fiti in Uria, so that the willing one is no harm done. And third of all, the um, golden rule, uh, so the Christian ethics with the golden rule that um, um, basically that uh, the principle that uh, you, uh, you want others to be treated uh, as one should be treated. Yeah. Very well. 
Um, it is arguable that Greek philosophy and the Christian faith and Roman law together have made Europe what it is. It's equally arguable that Greek philosophy, the Christian faith, and Roman law are symptoms of the ultimate forces that made Europe as it is. But undoubtedly, there, there has been something special about European development. To even take, I'm not talking about the past 400 years. If you look at Europe over the past 2,500 or even 3,000 years, there are so many divergences between Europe and the rest of the world. A and even when civilization in Europe has temporarily collapsed, th this has not stopped those divergent tendencies. It's merely put them into hibernation. As soon as the recovery has come, Europe moves off again in its very different path of development. And so, um, I don't have an answer to your question. I, I would just say that uh, we are probably very lucky that the Roman Empire emerged in, in the f second and first centuries BC. It unified Europe. It enabled the spread of those three forces, the, uh, of Greek philosophy, of Roman law, and of the Christian faith. And um, it gave a degree of unity to Europe that it has never possessed before or since. We should be very glad that this happened. And at the same time, we should be very, very glad that it didn't last. The Roman Empire was an excellent idea, and letting it fall to pieces was an even more excellent idea. A uh, question for Dr. Bandulet. Uh, in view of your description about the looting of Germany, what do you think about the current so-called migration crisis and the inflow of hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people, which have nothing to do with German traditions, German culture, and so on? Is this a problem that will eventually destroy Germany and maybe the whole of Europe, European civilization? Uh, yes. Uh, this certainly is a part of, uh, of, um, of, of my subject, uh, Beuteland. Uh, I wouldn't go so far as to uh, mention these young uh, Arabs who, uh, uh, who rape uh, German uh, women now on, on a weekly basis by the way uh, they seem to regard them as prey uh, but this is something else it will be very expensive we have in Germany two experts for generational accounting uh, and one is uh, Professor Raffelhüschen and he has, tr has tried to calculate uh, how much this kind of immigration will cost. And don't forget, 80% uh, of them have no um, professional qualification whatsoever, 80%. So, and if you import them into a highly developed uh, social state, then you have a problem. To give you one example, um, our daughter has, from her professional position, the ability to look into personal <coughs> accounts and many, uh, money transfers. For instance, in Munich, uh, a couple of ref refugees, uh, a married couple with two children, they get uh, more than 3,000 euros. Now compare this to their own countries, where they come from, or compare it to what they would get in Italy, in Greece, in Eastern Europe, or in any other countries. So this really draws them in, and this makes it expensive. Now coming back to Professor Raffelhüschen, um, 
he uh, came out with the following calculation. If until 2020, not more than 2.1 million refugees come altogether, yeah? and if they need only uh, six years to be fully integrated in the market, in the job market, I mean, then it costs Germany altogether, and that's the whole equation, nearly one billion uh, uh, Deutsche Mark. In, in, in English, uh, I would say one trillion, because I'm, I'm talking about uh, 1,000 uh, billion, English billion. So that's a lot of money. And don't forget, uh, the annual budget of the um, uh, national government in Berlin is now around uh, 330 uh, billion. So this whole thing will certainly cost a lot of money. And yeah, it's, it's also a prey country. And again, uh, um, partly I understand it. They were invited, but they all want to go to Germany, not to other countries. And again here, the government has uh, kept silent during the election campaign, but everybody knows next year, yeah, the families of these more than one million refugees who are mainly male, no? young males, uh, will be allowed to join them. And nobody knows how many will come. Okay, the, interior min the present interior minister wants to stretch it out, to uh, postpone it by one or two years or whatever. But uh, the story is not yet over, by the way. It really, this will go on and on. The last calculation is that this year there will be a bit less than 200,000 uh, so-called refugees coming into Germany. Uh, but nobody knows. And the same thing with the euro. Um, this, the euro has dropped out completely of uh, public discussion in Germany, but it's not solved. I mean, it, it's kept alive artificially by zero uh, interest rates, which always favor uh, the debtors, of course, uh, and by the uh, European Central Bank buying up uh, 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 Bonds, government bonds. So nothing is solved. Um, situation is not very good. Okay.